Um, so, uh, by the way, HRA is a Swedish tech uh, company in the TV delivery space. I'm not going to talk about the company particularly this morning, but um, except in passing. But uh, we'll do the presentation in English, if that's okay with everyone in the room. It's certainly better than my Swedish. Um, and what we're really talking about is delivering TV, TV specifically rather than video. I think. Um, I forget now how long it's been since video became the dominant traffic type on the internet. It's been a few years, um, but within that, thankfully, it turns out there's only there's only so many kitten videos we can watch, and actually, the video traffic is now being dominated by TV, conventional kind of TV programming delivered over IP. So, um, you know, within that, what do we what do we mean when we talk about? Um, uh, my headline here, making TV amazing again. Well, I, I guess for me, when I grew up, probably lots of people, I was a sort of similar age group, one or two younger folks in the room, but you know, t TV was kind of, re your life revolved around certain TV programs, whether it was the football highlights, whether it was the chart show or your favorite kids program. And, and um, it was pretty central to the family. It was a pretty amazing ex experience, television. And uh, it really, uh, I mean, it, it evolved, we had more channels, you know, satellites come along, cables come along, but the actual kind of content and the viewing experience really didn't change too much until, um, until just recently. So I'll start by just th sort of thinking, well, what's happening with this television traffic? You know, what's it all about? What do we mean by um, amazing TV? Um, by the way, if anyone has absolutely no interest in this presentation but feels too embarrassed to get up and leave, I've put a, um, a film or TV quote on every slide that might be relevant. So if you're not interested in anything I'm saying, just see if you know the TV quotes. It'll, it'll get you through to lunch. Um, so a few things that are happening, I, I guess, with, t with TV going online. And the first one is about, uh, which has already happened, t TVs, we can watch TV now ex exactly whenever we want to watch it. We can watch it on catch up. We can download stuff, we can watch it in the train, we can watch it on different devices. So already we've seen quite a shift there. What we're sort of starting to see now um, is a shift from uh, TV being a sort of imitation, pale imitation of reality to being much closer to the real thing. So um, standards 4K, Ultra HD of course, uh, we've got one or two customers now uh, doing some virtual reality TV, there's some kind of Big Brother style programs that go out um, in virtual reality. And I think um, we've got some basketball stuff going over our network also with a 360 degree view. So that's kind of interesting where so TV is kind of emulating being as good as real life. And probably, I mean, who knows quite where it'll go, but probably we'll start seeing it become an experience which is you know, even better than real life. And you'll be able to have virtual camera angles, you'll be able to sit in the middle of the pitch of the sports ground, you'll be able to so watch multiple cameras simultaneously. You already can, in fact, if you're watching on Sky, I think, watch multiple cameras simultaneously. Um, and, and online TV has really enabled this. So uh, what does that mean, or what does that mean to deliver all this stuff? So, and uh, actually my film quote here from Jaws is, is probably very apt. Um, because what it's done to the network is, is staggering. I mean, I've spent my time, most of my career in the networking business, so involved with building out internet from the early days. And um, we didn't quite see this coming, I think it's fair to say, in the networking business, at least the scale of it. So we used to broadcast everything. And even when we, sort of, we first saw TV going online with IPTV services, it used a multicast protocol, which is basically an IP equivalent of broadcast. You tuned in, you watched the same thing as everybody else. But now we're watching when we want to watch, we're watching on different device types which have different formats. Um, we're inserting a personalized ad which is different to the next guy. And all of a sudden, everybody's getting their own stream. So a million people watching a football match uh, on a broadcast technology, you send it out once. Even with IPTV, you send it out once. You're generating three meg of traffic. The moment those million people are watching in this new world, you're generating a million times three mega traffic just for that show. And that's, we're not even talking big, big numbers there. So um, yeah, you're going to need a bigger boat. So it, it turns out that the answer isn't to try to make the internet um, a few million times bigger because it's, it's pretty big already and, uh, and we still need to grow it despite everything else we do. So the, the way we scale TV um, is through a technology which is CDNs, CDN, Content Delivery Networks, basically. And um, 
I saw some stats recently from the Cisco report. You may often look at the Cisco. They do quite a comprehensive report into video and TV. Um, and I think they were suggesting that something like 65, 70% of the world's internet traffic crosses a CDN. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about CDNs. And I just for those of you, there might be one or two people in the room here that are going, actually, I'm not too sure what one of those is. Um, just, I'll just do a quick, a quick 101 on, on what is a CDN and why does it scale delivery. So on the left-hand side here, we've got some... We've got some content we want to get across to our, our viewer who's sitting on the right-hand side. And in the middle of that, we have an IP network. And that network um, might be your own network. If you're a cable operator, it might be just the public internet. You might be reaching off-net subscribers across a public internet. But there it is. It's a network. And it wasn't really built to handle several mil million people watching their own unicast stream of 4K television. So uh, what we do with a CDN is we have a centralized library there. Um, now, if that's VOD, the, all of the programs will be sitting in, in, in your library there. It might just be ingesting live channels um, as well. Um, and the first thing that happens when you press play is there's a, there's a request there that comes in from your client. Uh, you might be watching on a tablet. You might be watching on a set-top box. But that device is sending a request in, and it's saying, please play me. Um, please start the football, or please play me uh, episode five of Game of Thrones. That comes in again to this at a central location. Um, and this central location looks around, and it figures out the best way to play that back. And if nobody else has watched that, if you're the first person um, in your area, in your country, to watch episode five of Game of Thrones, which is unlikely, but somebody is, um, then it will stream it out across the network. But as it streams it out across the network, it also puts a copy of that show in uh, a device, some um, server basically, uh, which is a distributed device, which is deeper out in the network. Um, we can talk a bit later about how deep is, is, is deep enough. And, um, but essentially, that server's keeping a copy of the first program that gets played out. Uh, and, and it also, of course, sends the program out without, hopefully without any delay, not always, hopefully without some delay to the user. So the next user that wants to watch that same program, or indeed tune into the live uh, uh, broadcast of that program, doesn't get it sent from the middle. Their request goes to the center because the client doesn't know any different, and the center understands that there's a server there with a copy of that program already in it, and it streams it locally. So in an extreme case here, if you had um, you know, one of those in every head end, in every telephone exchange, you know, you'd, you'd never see any buffering on this internet television. That would be a, 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 um, a superb uh, set of infrastructure. In practice, they're not normally that widely deployed. And um, there's, a, there's a balance, obviously. There's always an economic balance with um, how, well you, how far you deploy this sort of equipment. And we'll talk a bit about that as well. But um, that's basically what a CDN is. So the first choice, I suppose, that uh, people have in this, in this world of delivering TV is um, you can go and buy CDN as a service. You can buy it from some pretty big global operators. Um, Akamai, I think, are the biggest CDN provider. Uh, level 3 provide a lot of, of CDN services. Um, is there anyone in the room from a CDN service provider? I doubt it in this audience. Oh, there is. From Nokia. From Nokia. OK, so I'll be careful what I say about CDN services. No, it's, uh, the, the, so, um, so you have a choice. And, and, and Nokia also provide the equipment for other people to build CDN services, much like Edgeware did as well. So, um, so you can buy a service. And, and, and a service here essentially means that you are putting your video in at the, at the core side of the feed and letting Akamai, Level 3, whoever, worry about distributing that, storing it, and pushing it back out. Now, a lot of people, especially if you own networks, would look at that and say, this might not make much sense for me because I already own a network. Why am I taking my traffic off my network, giving it to someone else's network, and paying them to deliver it? Um, and they might build their own uh, CDN. Uh, so that would be not the only factor, but one factor. It's easier for people to build their own if they already have a network. Um, but we'll come back to that because that's not essential. So CDN services. Um, like most network services, really, they, uh, they work better on an economic basis 
um, if, uh, if you don't have so much traffic, then there's less sense in building your own. If your users and viewers are dispersed all around the world, then it's a very expensive thing to go and build a global CDN, so it probably doesn't make any sense. Um, conversely, uh, if you've got an economy of scale, if you've got enough viewers on your own network, then people sometimes think about building their own. Uh, and generally, these people that we work with, but I'll, I'll talk about both options a little bit, because it doesn't always make sense here. Sometimes they're doing it for economic reasons, um, because you've got a normal model here where you've, you've built something out, you haven't got an OPEX model, you've got more of a CAPEX model. Uh, sometimes they're doing it for quality reasons, um, either low latency delivery or just r a control over the buffering. So um, one of the things that um, you know, I often like to sort of think about in terms of like, let's have a look at what other people are doing and, and who are other people. And I suppose when you think about online TV, the first company you think about is Netflix, um, huge uh, dominant provider. They actually, Netflix have a somewhat simpler problem than probably most of you guys do if you're delivering online TV because they only do VOD. Uh, they don't have any live services to worry about. Um, so they have quite a simple problem to solve actually. And they've, d they've, um, They've built their own CDN. It's exactly what they've done. They've deployed about 1,600 servers around the world. So when you press play on Netflix, your, your client's going through to some central location, but the, uh, the actual program's being delivered from a server located in some data center nearer you than Netflix head office. They also use a lot of cloud technology as well. And um, but they don't use it for the heavy lifting, if you like. They don't use it for the streaming and the caching. Um, that they've done on their own kind of con um, their own design technology that uh, that um, we would advocate. We'd say that's a good way of scaling your network. If I don't think uh, I don't think Netflix are, are, are stupid people. I think they've done a pretty good job, and I think the way they've architected their solution is something which we would advocate is a good solution, especially for what they do. So a little bit about architecture. Um, I'll try not, we won't be two bits and bytes in here, but a um, uh, little bit about architecture. There's, there's various things you need to do really to deliver your TV. There's various functions. And some of those functions are around content. And, and arguably they're not even really CDN things. A lot of these are, are things that are, we'd call origin functions if, if you're in the TV delivery business over IP. Um, actually ingesting these live channels and converting them into your VOD library, for example. Uh, controlling the viewers um, cloud DVR services so uh, it's it's a it's an interesting world that we're into because we're all used to having our own our own sense of recording programs that we like to think that there's a there's a recording even if it's in the network that's our recording um, so we have to manage that um, there's subtitling not such a problem in Europe but certainly in uh, in a lot of markets in Asia in particular, um, a lot of subtitling that comes out of the TV business comes as image. And most digital players don't like image. They don't um, image based. They're really looking for text. So um, you've got to do conversion sometimes and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So, so there's, there's a sort of set of functions that have to happen at the content layer. Um, then there's a set of functions which are more like, they're more network functions. They're not network in the sense of they're not MPLS or, you know, um, but they, they are network-like functions. Um, one of those is a CDN selection function. So do you even, uh, when you want to stream something out, are you streaming it over your own CDN? Is it um, going off net? Do you want to stream it over somebody else's CDN? Um, a very, very important function here is this request routing function. And this is really the brains of any CDN. And it's the bit that figures out where, um, where the nearest copy is to you. And uh, along with load balancing, is that a best place to serve it from? So it might be closest to you, but that server might be busy. And then there's some other things. You might want to, um, you might want to segment your infrastructure because you want to provide CDN service for yourself and for a customer, so another customer. So um, we've got a, a good example that we provide the uh, infrastructure in Holland to KPN. KPN have a couple of million online subscribers, uh, but they also segment that infrastructure and they provide 
the delivery for the national Dutch broadcaster. So they're reusing that, but of course, like all multi-tenancy environments, then you need, you need some security and segmentation to go in those network functions. And then there's the kind of heavy lifting part that I referred to before, the, the delivery part. Um, and that can include a number of functions, but the, the, the absolute kind of core stuff there is the streaming itself and the caching. So this is where you, you're copying your content and you're streaming it out. Um, some, of those, uh, some of those functions work uh, very well on cloud and virtualized IT infrastructure, particularly the top two. So we would normally advocate that that kind of function is delivered in a data center environment. You can completely virtualize it if you want. You can move all to the cloud. All of that's good. The cloud's always good. It's a rule of life, isn't it, these days? What, what can't be better than something in the cloud? Well, it turns out the bit that can't be better than something in the cloud is the bottom layer. And actually, there's nothing wrong with the cloud itself. And there's nothing wrong with virtualizing that. You can run it in software. You can run it across VMware machines. But what you do have to be aware of is actually where is it located? Because if you, the, the, the problem we have with the word cloud is we tend to think cloud equals centralized. And if we centralize all of those functions, we haven't bypassed any of the internet at all or any of our own network, and we haven't got a CDN. So the physical location of that delivery layer is important. So all the options are open, as I say, we can don't have to run that, don't have to run that in a, as a standard um, appliance, and we can talk a bit about the options there, but the location does matter. So some of those things are I've, I've color-coded, you might notice. Um, pink things are generally things which are kind of, in, in TV parlance, are called origin functions. Um, some of those things that would normally be done at the origin are potentially moved out to the edge with a purpose-built CDN. And, I'll talk about a couple of examples there um, to give you an indication. So, um, so one of the things that uh, we would normally, as an industry, do in our in our origin is repackaging. Now, um, if you're if you're not in the kind of TV in the middle of TV tech, um, you're probably going, oh, I don't even know what repackaging is. Is it the same as encoding? No, it's not. Although it sounds like it is. Um, repackaging is the stage of the process where you you um, convert the file for different client type protocols. So uh, as someone always said, the great thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. And this is a perfect example of that case. So a Microsoft device and an Apple device and an Android device and a set-top box don't want the same format of video. They expect a different format. So traditionally, what we do there is we would um, we would create the four, three, four different formats that people use, and we would treat each one as its own show. So um, as far as the CDN is concerned, we just have three or four different versions of every file uh, ready to stream, um, which is obviously quite expensive. Uh, we use three, time, three times as much memory. We use three or four times as much backhaul capacity getting out to the server. So what you can do if you optimize your CDN for TV is you can repackage actually live as you stream. Now, this is quite significant. So, so bear in mind, we're in an industry here which has got 4K coming at us. In fact, a lot of, our, a lot of viewing still happens online in, in standard definition. I think it's, it's um, you know, we kind of think, oh, it's all, that's old school. But actually, a lot of our customers will find 50% of their viewing still done in standard definition. So HD is still, is still hitting these infrastructures, which has got four times as big file size. And 4K is around the corner, and that's got four times as big file size again. So one way of mitigating against that is suddenly going, actually, let's just send stuff across in a common file format and then repackage it at the edge. We win back about a factor of three or four in efficiency again. So that means we can probably use the same kind of infrastructure to deliver the next generation of, of uh, definition. So that's quite cool. Um, and, it, and, and the performance benefits here as well, because um, when you scale these CDNs out, you have to decide how much memory you're going to put in them. And the more memory you put in them, the more content you cache locally. The more content you cache locally, the less chance you have of that buffering. Of course, if you can 
store in one file format, you can store three or four times the content. So this, this, is, this is all good. So that would be an example. Um, another example I'll use is about content protection and piracy. So um, content protection and piracy, not, it's, it's been a big thing for a while, but I think recently, the last 12 months, it's becoming a huge issue for the industry. Um, I think I remember reading that more people watched the episode of Game of Thrones illegally than legally. And a lot of them were probably paying for it. And they didn't even realize they were on a pirate site. You know, these sites are so, so good. The quality is often good. Um, 4K is exaggerating this problem because generally when you pirate contract content, you degrade the quality. But when it starts at 4K, you can degrade it quite a bit and it's still pretty good. So, so that's quite hard. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of schemes and things in place that you, you have to do to deliver this DRM, digital rights management schemes. Um, but something we're starting to see a lot of interest now is actually digitally watermarking the content. Now, fundamental flaw when you want to keep a, want to put a unique watermark in a piece of content going through a CDN is that the CDN copies the content. That's how CDNs scale. So copying something with a watermark in is of no benefit whatsoever. So what you need to do is embed that watermark again as it's streamed out of your, out of your CDN, embed a unique code. And that's the kind of thing um, that you can do if you optimize there um, with, your, with, your, uh, with your infrastructure. So a couple of other things um, to mention. So one is, uh, you know, if you decide that you want to build your own infrastructure, and that's a, that's a big if. I'll come back to the, the balance of that in a little bit, because it doesn't make sense for everybody to build their own. Um, then you're faced with some other challenges. Do you do this stuff in hardware? Do you do this stuff in appliances? Um, uh, we can, I can honestly say I can be completely neutral on this. We provide everything in both our own hardware and as a software version, so we have no axe to grind in this debate. Our advice would normally be, where's it going to lo be located? If these platforms, if these servers are going to be in a, a data center environment, it makes a lot of sense to do it in software, running on standard hardware, or even on virtualized hardware. If they're going to be located in a non-data center friendly environment, in a telephone exchange type environment, for example, um, then it makes sense to use appliances that are very low maintenance, that are very low power consumption, they're not going to fall over. Um, I think I might apologize for my one product advert. I've got a product slide. Here we go. Yes. <coughs> at, at some point, I don't know if, if I'll ever give a presentation working for a tech company where I never actually have a picture of a box in it. It'd be disappointing. One day that'll happen. But this is, um, this is our server. There it is, um, advert done. But just to kind of give this into perspective, this is a one rack unit device, it's all solid state. So if we filled that with, with memory, we could cache the entire Netflix catalog in our one rack unit box, um, which is quite impressive and stream quite a lot of stuff from it. So they're quite powerful things. Um, but you could do exactly the same thing with an HP server or a Dell server. Um, it just wouldn't have our logo on, so I can't put it on the slide because it's not how these things work. And, and, and the Netflix figure is, is is a bit of a marketing number, and, and I say that, and I do run marketing. I don't mean it's a marketing number in the fact that it's not real, but you don't really need to cache that much. Most people pr probably put about um, four terabytes of, of storage in, and that's, that's plenty. Um, so there you go, that's the server. So why are people doing this? What are they getting out of it? And when does it make sense? Um, so I'm conscious that there's a, this sort of cable focus here in the room. Um, these are some of our, operate, our customers who are cable operators who have done this. Uh, they, yeah, across the board, you can read the names for yourself. Um, a few from, from the Nordics there, which is our, obviously our home market in Holland. Televisia, largest cable operator in Mexico, have a very large uh, deployment of their own CDN. Um, but it's not just the cable guys, I think also interesting, and, and a company I'll just spend a moment talking about, are other more traditional TV type companies, so satellite operators. TVB are um, probably not a company you'd necessarily know if you come from these parts, but they are the largest Chinese language producer of content 
in the world. They're based in Hong Kong. Uh, sorry, the largest independent one, I should say. Um, so they have, they have, you know, they're a satellite operator. They have uh, studios. They make soap operas. They rebroadcast the Olympics. They're, you know, they're, they are, they are the main commercial channel in Hong Kong and for a lot of Chinese people outside Hong Kong. So um, they're actually talking publicly about dropping their satellite license altogether. So they launched online TV services about 18 months ago. They have four and a half million subscribers already. Uh, which is a lot even, even for Hong Kong. Um, they do targeted inline ads. Um, they do all the kind of clever services you might expect. Uh, the Olympic stuff they did was mostly in 4K, uh, and they did all of this online. So those, I think these types of companies are really interesting, and this sort of shift, very fast shift for some of these operators is, is quite exciting to be part of. Um, so why are they doing this? Well. Um, TVB used to use uh, Akamai uh, to distribute in Hong Kong, and they still use Akamai, actually they use Akamai and Limelight to distribute over a CDN service for Offnet outside of Hong Kong. But for the bulk of their traffic, probably 85% of it, um, they're in a simple world of, it's, it's, it's more cost effective to spend money on some capex, deploy some servers, and then operate at low on ongoing cost their TV delivery, as opposed to pay per byte, which is how a CDN service works. You pay per byte delivered. Um, and if somebody starts watching in 4K instead of HD, your bill goes up by a factor of four. I mean, that's just how it works. So, um, so that's kind of one reason, generally, the OPEX CAPEX. Uh, the other reason that someone like that would have moved would be quality of experience. So. Um, if you're in control of where those servers are, you can put a denser um, population of servers out in your geography. So most CDN service providers offer a global service, and they don't have the kind of density that you might look to deploy yourself. Um, I mentioned KPN in Holland. So KPN have 160 points of presence in Holland. Now, Holland's not a very big place. Probably a lot of you have been. Uh, it's, you know, it's a pretty small country, and they have 160 different points of presence that they're streaming their TV service from. Um, so you can imagine the level of quality they've got compared to, say, going through a service which might have a pop in at Rotterdam and Amsterdam and Utrecht. You know, it, it's a significant difference. Uh, latency um, has, again, been an issue sort of sub-second latency, which again, you can do if you're in control of the whole delivery chain. And then the final thing is probably analytics. So understanding exactly what the viewer experience is, understanding if somebody would stop watching a program, whether that was because the network was an issue at the same time they swapped, or they just didn't like the program. And you can understand these kind of things if you own the whole delivery chain. So. Um, I'm just sort of going to conclude with a, a slide actually from Frost and Sullivan. So Frost and Sullivan, the analysts, probably know them, um, uh, did a report recently around uh, what point it makes sense to build your own delivery network. And uh, they identified a few things. And I think I'm going, to, I'm going to drill down on a couple of these because these are the areas which, are, which we see a lot of. So the first is, is how many subscribers have you got? Um, this isn't a precise science, but I think their number of 50,000 is probably about right. Uh, if you sit in there with less than 50,000 viewers, you should definitely buy a service. You know, it does not make sense to build your own infrastructure. Um, the second point on here around predictability, uh, it's actually not so much does it have spikes, because all TV services have spikes, that's normal. Um, but if you own the kind of content that people watch once a week on a Saturday afternoon, and then they don't watch their, your service again, Again, it makes sense to go to a service provider. Um, if you've got the kind of content that people watch regularly most evenings, then it makes more sense to build your own. And the third one on here is, is also really important, which is how geographically condensed is your audience? If they're all in one country, that makes a lot more sense than if they're spread out around the world. And like our TVB example, there's nothing to stop you having a hybrid either. So you could use you could build your own um, for, uh, CDN for your local delivery, 
and then offload the, the international delivery through, uh, through another um, CDN service provider. So um, good news also here is that I'm about done. Um, so we've got about 150, I guess, people that use our technology to do this. Other technologies are available. Um, Nokia have some. Um, I, shan't, I shan't get into that. But, um, uh, so, but I didn't really want to come here today and do the kind of, you know, our, our box is better than their box or our software is better than their software. What I did want to talk about really is that just to make people aware that there, are, there is quite some momentum for people building their own infrastructure. There are times it works. There are times it doesn't make sense. Um, this is my favorite quote of my slide set. Um, but with that, I'm sure we we'll probably won't have time for any Q&A because it's lunchtime, but I am going to be around over lunch. So if I'm without wanting to tread on the chairman's territory, I'm probably going to volunteer that that might be a better time to do Q&A. So um, yeah, thanks very much, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chat later. Thank you.